Hi everyone and uh, welcome to tonight's webinar hosted by the Australian Monarchist League with our guest Sean Jacobs. Uh, my name is Jeremy Mann and I'm the chairman of the Victorian Young Monarchists and a media spokesperson for the AML as well as being the host for this evening. Tonight Sean will be speaking on the topic of what's driving an Australian Republic. Sean is a security specialist and policy expert having worked for Australia's National Security Advisor and is a lead planner for the 2018 Commonwealth Games and the Brisbane G20 Leaders Summit. Sean holds a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations from Griffiths University and a postgraduate certificate in Policing, Intelligence and Counterterrorism from Macquarie University. He is also a former Brisbane City Council election candidate, ministerial advisor, United Nations worker, international youth volunteer and national water polo champion. I'd like to invite you to um, save your questions till the end for Sean and uh, would like to invite Sean to take over. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. And I presume everyone can hear me. I will just now um, move to sharing my screen. I've prepared a few um, PowerPoint slides for this evening and the presentation. So just bear with, um, presuming those are now all up on screen. Excellent. All right, well, thank you very much again, Jeremy, um, honoured guests and friends of the Monarchist League, and thanks for tuning in this evening. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, the topic tonight and what I'll be speaking to tonight is this question of what's driving an Australian Republic. Um, and I'll be touching on some of the historical drivers um, and some of the contemporary drivers and the distance between those two things, but really focusing on the role of the Governor General and what I think is another key driver of modern Republicans, and that is a hostility towards Buckingham Palace, or more specifically, hereditary privilege. And then, of course, just going into, although it's better covered in another part of or another presentation for another future webinar, how uh, monarchists should be responding to these um, contemporary drivers from the Republican movement. Um, so when looking at the modern Republican movement, there are a range of claims made. Indeed, it's a broad church, but not in a straightforward sense. So some of the drivers are listed on the screen there, and as you can see, there's a multitude. So some are um, suspicious and hostile to the British monarchy, uh, specifically Buckingham Palace. Others are more concerned about uh, Australia's perception in Asia and securing trade and commercial transactions. Um, and even uh, in 1999, the lead up to the um, referendum, one leading Republican figure said that a republic was about environmental sustainability, as well as themes of social justice and equality. Um, but these are, of course, slightly at odds to Republican goals or objectives or drivers of years past. Um, throughout the 19th century uh, in Australia, Republican ideals were strongly tethered to ideas of self-government, so independence from Britain, um, extending the franchise, which means extending the vote, land reform and property qualifications. And of course, we can't deny that Republican ideals, at least by the 1850s in Australia, uh, were, were starting to circulate with some velocity um, globally. So um, there's a great or well, wonderful immortal reply from Benjamin Franklin there that he uttered, and that's his um, portrait there. Um, when asked in 1775, um, when leaving Independence Hall in, in Philadelphia, um, if what they'd given the United States of America was a republic or a monarchy, a monarchy pardon me, is a mortal reply was a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Um, but closer to home and back on Australian soil, it was this figure, the Reverend uh, Dr. John Dunmore Lang, was a prolific advocate and writer and very much in the firebrand mould. And his book, um, but listed there on the second point, uh, Freedom and Independence, for the golden lands of Australia, according to one uh, leading Republican intellectual today, was and remains the definitive treatise on Australian republicanism. Um, but what Lang writes about in that book is sort of fairly impenetrable to a modern Australian audience, but he does appeal to these themes of coherence around coming of age and maturing as a nation, um, which are themes that Paul Keating used to touch on in the 19. Uh, 90s when this debate was very much heating up. Um, but I've got an extract here, um, and apologies if it's a little bit difficult to read, but 
Um, this is a speech that Lang um, gave in 1851 to electors of Sydney. And again, it's just illustrative of these sorts of themes of coming of age and maturing um, as a nation. And of course, modern Republicans don't tend to use the language around freedom and independence. Instead, they deploy um, terms around transparency, openness, accountability, and so on. I'll touch on that very shortly. Um, but what we learn and what we all know as Australians is that um, coming to Federation is that Republicanism wasn't quite um, needed at the time. Um, so John Hurst in the first bullet point, the late John Hurst, who was a devout uh, Republican himself, even conceded that Republicanism wasn't, need, wasn't needed, pardon me, um, when coming to Federation. And indeed, it sort of seems that um, Republicanism, Republicanism, pardon me, laid somewhat dormant um, around Federation, at least in, in the period up uh, through to World War II. And I sense a lot of the Republican uh, criticisms of this period up until World War II tend to be retrospective. So for example, um, if you read Malcolm Turnbull's 1993 Fighting for the Republic, um, a lot of that period, um, he, he lays claim to um, what he refers as Australia's docile obedience to British wishes. So Britain's um, over interference, he would claim in Australia's foreign policy. Um, and again, this, this term of docile obedience to Britain. Um, the third point there I have on the slide is a failure to defend Singapore, which is a point that not just Republicans um, make, but a lot of people on, on multiple sides of this debate, that uh, Britain failed to provide air support during World War II, leading to the fall of Singapore. Um, but it's a common claim made around Republicans that uh, I guess when we relied on Britain the most, uh, Britain was not here to defend us, uh, at least geographically. Um, so again, it sort of lays dormant. This period um, uh, relies on a lot of retrospective criticism among Republicans. Um, but then sort of coming into the post-World War II era, Geoffrey Bolton, the historian, Australian historian, um, wrote an article in 1963 where he sort of turns the question or turns things to some of the big questions um, around Australia about thinking big, uh, identity as a nation, and then really um, answering this question around this term, the head of state, and asking why they're not an Australian. And of course, coming into 1972, um, more focus and more eyes were on the role of the Governor General, which really catalyzed the debate um, in the post World War II uh, period and up until the 90s, and of course, that's still with us today. So now just moving quickly um, to the more modern Republican arguments today, and it's clear that they've moved away some distance in terms of um, language and approach. And the models are all different, of course, by Republicans, whether it's direct election, parliamentary appointment, qualification rules, and, and so on. But what's interesting is they all center on this one position, and that's the role of the governor general. And the key point I think to make is that it's not just a name change, even though there's what's proposed is what's called a minimalist model. Um, so simply replacing the very same powers and functions of the governor general with an Australian president. But if you actually look at the Republican designs um, and some of the proposed changes to the constitution, they're hugely significant. So um, we're talking here about crossing out huge slabs of the Australian constitution. So various parts of the text and replacing those with other parts, and I put some of the um, some of the elements on the screen there. But um, the key point again to just return to it that it's not just a name change; it carries significant changes to the constitution. The other point, um, of course, made by modern Republicans, at least from what I can detect, is a I think everyone can detect is a palpable dislike of the British monarchy and specifically Buckingham Palace, and some of those criticisms um, are all listed on the screen there. I find the second one quite interesting. Um, but again, I think this, it, this last point around terminology is quite interesting. Um, so moving away from terms like freedom and independence towards terms like transparency, openness, accountability, and having a say, these tend to be, uh, this is the vernacular that modern Republicans tend to deploy. And of course, from here, it's not too far a leap to over-exaggerate the role that uh, Buckingham Palace plays in the day-to-day -day affairs of or current affairs in Australia. 
Um, and I think there's obviously this tactic, of course, as well, to just pounce on any royal inconsistency or any perceived mishandling from Buckingham Palace. And I think the palace letters are one example of this, and that remains to be seen. And it's a discussion to be had elsewhere, of course, but it's just one example. Um, but as you can see, it's very much overlaid, and these are some of the um, very recent Republican Republic movement um, pictures the, or graphics that have been put up. And it's very much around this language again of having your say. So um, you taking action, um, things being about you uh, and not the royal family. So now just in responding to these claims, um, the most significant point, and made it a few times, but just to make it again, is that isn't simply a name change in when it comes to the role of the Governor General. So Australia being a young nation, we often forget that this position has actually had over a century of custom and tradition behind it. And I've got a picture there of um, the late Paul Hasluck, so he was a former Governor General, and made a wonderful um, lecture, um, which has been turned into a small booklet, um, in 1979 called the Keel Memorial Lecture. And he speaks elo eloquently, or very eloquently, to the, those customs that I've put on the, on the screen there, and some of those traditions around the role of the Governor General. And I think, and I sense, if we're changing line upon line of our constitution, it tends to modify and indeed trample on all of these conventions that have um, been stood up and been localised in the Australian context. And also, um, and I think this kind of gets to um, what I think is one of the fundamental contradictions of modern Republicans, is that we're told this is a mini minimal or minimalist model, um, when indeed um, it's actually not. Uh, again, it's more than a name change. But then also the other important point to make is that they, we would expect, or Republicans, I should say, would expect um, a president to stay out of politics, and indeed that's what they claim. Um, but when we're moving away from these sorts of binding traditions that has like mentions and then the conventions that we all know and respect and provide stability, then when it, it would really elevate uh, the president's role, who replaces the governor general, um, to be um, subject to various uh, things that uh, where we don't have a community consensus on. For example, climate change, or if you take um, one of the other, um, I guess, pet um, projects of one of the leading Republicans, uh, Peter Fitzsimons, sugar taxes as well. So we kind of, uh, in the modern political environment, would, would entirely expect an Australian president to be subject to various uh, whims or things, as I mentioned, that there is no community consensus on, rather than providing stability and staying out of these things, which is what the current Governor General uh, does. And of course, the other point to make there, and I've got it on the last bullet point, is that, and Hasluck does make this point as well, is that the role of a Governor General has actually changed with time in Australia. So a Governor General um, in 1901 is very different um, in terms of the customs and traditions of the office to a Governor General in 1972. And indeed, I would even say um, quite different to 2020 versus 1972. So it is an institution that has uh, modified and has actually modernised itself while maintaining very strong elements of tradition as well. Now on this role, um, or in responding to this uh, driver of heredit or criticism of hereditary privilege, I think there's a very strong case to be made um, that it's actually a case of reform in particular. Um, I often say in any opportunity I have when I'm interviewed uh, for the AML um, that, you know, uh, British monarchy is not an example of, of life in 1220 Britain, but 2020 Britain, and indeed globally as well. And I think um, one of the reasons why is what Tony Abbott points out in that quote there, that it's actually a very good symbol of, tr of tradition, but also uh, liberty and modernising over time. We know, and history is of course full of examples of monarchies that lose their appeal, also lose their legitimacy, and then also um, create instability. I think there's lots of examples of that. And I think one of the reasons the Queen in particular, um, or Buckingham Palace as well, and the traditions of the office have always maintained or carried some sense of legitimacy and public legitimacy at that, 
is because they've appealed to strong elements of tradition, but then also uh, change and modernity as well. And I think this other point too that Walter Badgett makes is that there's a lot of appeal, um, I think, when it comes to monarchy in a global sense. Um, and, you know, it's not just recognisable, but it's, there's a universal appeal there. And I think that's what Walter Badgett's driving there. And I think that's why um, globally you can have a lot of respect for uh, the institution of the monarchy, but in particular the Queen um, in, vir in virtually all parts, of the, all parts of the globe. So um, just in closing and summing up, um, modern Republican arguments, of course, have changed um, somewhat. And I think the, the original drivers that some of those things that we touched on or I touched on rather in the 1850s have actually largely evaporated. Um, and we, of course, now see modern Republicans range, uh, pardon me, raise a range uh, of motivations or drivers from raw mishaps, for example, um, to better perception in Asia, um, through to, as I've mentioned before as well, environmental sustainability, as well as themes of social justice and, and, and the like. Um, and I think there's an appeal with some of the language that Republicans deploy um, to elements that are already existing in our system. So accountability, transparency, openness, these are things that we, that we all have um, in our system. We all know that we possess them already and existing and they certainly won't be enhanced uh, through an um, Australian president um, and also replacing that, um, replacing the role of the Governor General. So I just have a, a small quote here, it's a favourite of mine. Um, we've of course had constitutional commissions examine this issue back to front, but I like this issue because, I like this uh, quote or this passage rather, because it's very straightforward and it really just illustrates um, that not only do foreigners recognise that Australia is a proud and independent country too, but we know in our heart of hearts that we're proud and independent country as well and a proud constitutional monarchy at that. So that sums up, um, I guess, my sort of formal side of remarks um, and the presentation, but of course, now happy to take questions and maybe back to you, Jeremy. Um, so thanks very much, appreciate it. Thanks, Sean. Great presentation, of course. Um, and yes, as Sean was saying, uh, now is the time for those people who would like to to submit questions to the Q and A. Um, so there is a function down the bottom of your screen which you should be able to enter some some questions that you may have uh, to Sean or the rest of the panel as well. Um, so if you'd like to start uh, sending those through, that would be fantastic, and then I'll uh, ask those when they come through. I guess I might start off with, with my own question, actually, Sean. Um, given that we see uh, the Republic movement uh, that, that's increasing, I guess, with uh, strength in Australia over the last 20 years since the last referendum, is there any kind of comparable, um, I guess, situation with any other country such as New Zealand or even in the UK that we could see uh, a flow and effect from that? Um, yeah, it's kind of a, it's a good question. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I sense that, um, look, I think the, the circumstances around our sort of local political settings are quite unique, I find. Um, there's so many different factors that um, go into um, what would create an issue like this or allow it to sort of get legs and grow in Australia versus other places. Um, I think it just... Um, you know, you look, for example, in New Zealand and um, the Republic movement here is certainly not in any sort of high gear compared um, or as organised or I believe as well resourced, uh, for example, as it is in Australia. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, a big factor is, is resourcing and uh, the political levers. Um, I think in other parts of the world, it just sort of seems to um, a lot of the countries that have already gone down the path of um, disposing of a constitutional monarchy and, and taking on a, a president becoming a republic have made that move already and made that switch. So I think, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good point. But I sense that, um, you know, it, it might sort of stop at Australian boundaries, um, given that, you know, this issue has been um, heating up for some time. Uh, the Republicans are incredibly well resourced 
Um, and I guess the other factor too is that it's in Labor Party politics as well. It's in their policy manifesto, so it will keep revolving every three years and keep coming up in a way that I don't believe it is in a lot of other democracies. Yeah, so we've got a, a question from Adam. Um, could you please tell us how we can convince Republicans to become monarchists and to show them that a republic would risk our Christian values and that it could risk uh, us becoming a dictatorship? Yeah, look, I think um, some of the points I touched on, I think, um, but I didn't sort of mention enough, and that's this point around stability um, and how important it actually is. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we that you know at least I find in debating Republicans is this like desire to look overseas, and I think we all hear the arguments very familiar that we need to just look to Ireland. They did it; they had a great president, so we should deploy it or do the same thing as well. I think the the best response to that is um, you know we've got to take a broad look at Republican models everywhere, and they don't tell a convincing story of stability. I mean, France deposed its monarchy and it's now, I believe, on its fifth republic. Um, Germany um, deposed its monarchy and became, it became a republic as well and succumbed very quickly to fascism. Um, but, you know, we're not saying that, of course, that's what will happen to Australia, but the history's example is, is very instructive and not just in, in Europe, of course, as well, but other parts of um, South America and, and, and Africa as well have replaced constitutional monarchies with republics and have been very worse off for them. So I think that's the case to be made um, there, that there's a lot of historical examples of um, huge amounts of instability. And we're not saying that Australia would overnight fold into that uh, or that level of instability, but it's just an instructive example of, of what we want to avoid. Uh, Josh, uh, has asked, why do you think that the Republicans are well resourced? Yeah, sure. So I think um, it's probably, I think given the profile probably of some of the um, leading figures in the movement, um, you know, of course, Malcolm Turnbull um, being a leading figure, incredibly well resourced and very wealthy in his own right. But I think the sort of networks and the connections that kind of bring, um, in a sense, there's a sort of natural philosophical affinity um, for, I guess, people who are, I would say, very progressive in, in their politics. And, I don't, you know, of course, this doesn't fit into a sort of clear left-right divide a lot of the time. Um, but, yeah, I sense that a lot of the people, um, you know, who tend to be on that side um, of the Republican debate um, are very heavily involved in the arts and entertainment industries. And of course that brings with it a lot of resources, a lot of connections and that sort of thing. So that would be, um, Josh, my sort of initial um, response. Yeah. And uh, if there was a referendum right now, do you think that Australia would have ended, um, yeah, inevitably become a republic after that? Um, I would like to think no. I think that um, there's still so much common sense uh, around um, that um, people overwhelmingly um, are still very... And I mean, if you look at voter trends and all that sort of thing, the Australian election study, the Republic is not going... Um, the desire for one is certainly not going upward. It's actually trending downward. And I think a lot of people still... They, they still don't see... Um, any convincing case. So I, I don't think um, it's a bright future for the Republican movement, but um, that's still, uh, monarchists like us still need to uh, make our case. Well, thank you for that. I don't think there are any more uh, questions to be answered at the moment, but if anyone in the audience uh, does think of a question after the webinar, feel free to message the uh, our, our contacts through the Australian Monarchist League and we'll definitely be happy to answer them uh, or pass them on to Sean as well to be answered. Uh, so just a, an announcement as well that our next webinar will be on Thursday, July the 16th with guest speaker Sean Burke, who is a renowned journalist and publisher of Politicom. Uh, Mr. Burke will be speaking on the topic of China versus Australian sovereignty. So details will be announced about that soon. I'd like to thank Sean uh, for being our guest speaker tonight, as well as Philip and Elliot for hosting. And of course, for everyone as well who has uh, joined us tonight. So um Thank you very much. I think we'll end the webinar soon, Elliot. Yes, um, 
Thanks, Jeremy, and uh, thank you once again. This, a copy of this recording will be available shortly on our website. So enjoy the rest of the evening.